Okay, I'd like to invite back to the stage Patrick Finley. He's going to introduce our speaker. Our speaker today is David Zock, and he is a futurist. No, really. He has a degree in futures research from the University of Houston. That's a real degree from a real university. Then again, he got that degree way back in 1981, so it's pretty much history at this point. Speaking of history, he's got a terrible employment record. He's been hired over 1,500 times to give speeches. Sadly, each of those jobs ended after only about an hour. Was it something he said? Probably. Today, David's going to talk about the fog of progress, and we'll offer a few futuristic thinking tools to help you look around and through that fog that surrounds us all. Please welcome David Zock, Futurist. Hi, nice to be here again. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, Mary uh, McCormick, she and I are like universal contacts. We run into each other at restaurants constantly. So the last time we saw, you know, I saw each other, she said, well, could you come in and help people try to understand all this mess that we're in? Sure. It'll take about three hours. She goes, great, we have three, 30 minutes. So we kind of had to go back and forth with it, but I came up with a great modern day compromise. I'm gonna take 30 minutes, but I'm gonna make it seem like it took three hours. <laughs> Let's begin. There we go. So Richard Saul Werman, anybody recognize the name? Think of his nickname, Ted, as in Technology, Entertainment, Design, the TED conferences. He started those. And he said, if you see connections between things, your choices will be less threatening. Think about what's not yet connected. People, things, ideas, especially people, things, and ideas that at first glance we didn't think were connectable. That's where you find wealth. And wealth is that which you value. How do we find more of it? When you're looking out there at current trends, current events, this day, divide your attention. Look for fads, trends, and principles. We think fads are bad, but they're kind of delightful. Treat them like a spice. They're fun. Enjoy them, but don't necessarily sort of get buried in them. Don't get seduced by fads. And fads quite often are being pushed. And they're being pushed particularly at teenagers because they're easier to seduce because they don't have anything, any context by which to judge them. Trends are longer term. There's a progression, there's change. More of this, less of that. And trends are things you invest in. And you quite often have to have delayed gratification with trends. You see it early and you place your bets. Principles are the things that don't change over time. So think about like, so um, Heraclitus, said, the only constant is change. And how many of you agree with that? Okay. You realize he said it 2,500 years ago and it hasn't changed. What doesn't change? In a time of tumultuous change, look for the things that don't change. Don't try to find the latest fad or trend right away. Find the things you can stand on you have a place to stand, then you can move the world. And of course, quite often, principles are paradoxical. So like freedom and equality, 
The historian Will Duranson said that freedom and equality are sworn and everlasting enemies. When one prevails, the other dies. But they're both valuable. So they have to balance. They dance because they ebb and they flow. So when you are looking at your decisions, looking at what you're doing, where do you put your attention? What are you ignoring? What do you need to pay attention to again? So you probably all have one of these devices. Some of you are looking at them right now. Have you ever heard the phrase, if there's an app for that, is there an app for you? Algorithms, which sort of are the thing underneath the apps, what they, what they do is they help make the word world measurable and predictable. But another word for predictable is boring. How predictable of a world do you want? If we take away surprises, we don't want the big surprises, but the delights of little surprises, those are pretty valuable. We can use the technology to get to a cheaper, faster, easier bottom line, or do we take it to find a farther horizon? Quite often we use the technology to hide behind when in fact it needs to support us. What else can we do with this, this stuff? Um, Peter Drucker, the sort of management guru, he said, if you can measure it, you can manage it. He said that like in, in the 1970s, you take it into this day and age, if you can measure it, you can automate it. What can't be automated? What shouldn't be automated? So we have sort of this battle between the measurable and the immeasurable. And if the only thing you pay attention to is measurable, you have lost immeasurable aspects of our society. How powerful are those algorithms and the AI? Think about how we relate to these things. We cradle them. We gaze into them. We talk to them. We listen to them. We stroke them. There's just two words to bind them all together. My precious. <laughs> Our behavior with these things is indistinguishable from an addiction or much, much worse. Worship. Here's a way of framing the impact of AI and the like. And by the way, just yesterday, last night, I read an article that at the University of Penn, the Wharton School of Business, an AI passed the MBA test. Those of you with MBAs are probably going, hmm. And the, one of the conclusions of the article is that education is going to be radically transformed in the coming years. But the opportunity is, look at it this way, 80% of what you do is probably going to be better done by a machine or by somebody else, but better done by a machine. You want to survive, you want to thrive, you got to figure out what's the unique 20%. What are the immeasurable things that you bring to, not just simply the workplace, but to the society and the organizations you belong to. Kevin Kelly uh, founded Wired Magazine. He said, it is not a race against the machine. It is and it always has been a race with the machine. Homo Faber, toolmakers. We have always been and we always will be toolmakers. And again, how do we use these to enhance our abilities to go to that farther horizon? rather than hiding behind it. In the book Range by David Epstein, he said there are three things that AI, the machines, aren't good at. The bigger picture, multiple point perspectives, 
and analogies, metaphors. And I was reading an article by Alison Gopnik, who is a cognitive scientist out in Berkeley. And in there, they talked about that Alan Turing in the 19, early 1950s came up with a Turing test where the computer can seem, you know, we can say that it's intelligent if it can carry on a conversation as an adult, with an adult. But he also said that, that an adult is not a good model for building a computer on. A three-year-old child, and how many of you have ever had a three-year-old? How many of you once were a three-year-old? How many of you are afraid to raise your hand in front of me? <laughs> the way their brains work, we're going to get into that. What we are really good at in this society is going, if this, then that. End of conversation. We are so good at creating things, of being productive. But the problem lies is, and then what happens? What happens, what comes after, what comes next? And if we're not looking at those multiple locations, so look at that leaf. That is, so it's take, go ahead, get it, we can wait. Um, look at the pattern on a leaf. So it's sort of chaos theory, it's natural nonlinear patterns. But imagine you're at the blue dot and you have to make a decision. And you have like five different options. And quite often at that first level, using the color red because that sometimes is a challenge. You make it through, but then what's else there? Because you can see some of the paths don't lead anywhere. The, the second level is more challenges, and then you finally get to the green, the, 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 uh, perhaps the money or the value. But with any decision, you have to understand there's lots of different options. And we have to be sort of more aware of trying to understand what are those options. So when looking at implications, think implications times three. What are the implications of the implications of the implications? And can you turn a, a, a negative implication eventually into a positive? I did that in my own life. I hated school. But it gave me a credential. So I had to delay gratification because I knew there was going to be something at the end. And it's been, you know, making a living as a futurist. That's pretty weird. When you hear a forecast about the future, you think about, you know, hear about a speculation, when you think, well, oh, that can't happen. The thing to do is say, all right, what, would have, what else would have to happen so that could happen? And it's sort of one of the things from, you know, from a futurist perspective is you don't take no for an answer. You just keep on wondering what are the other options? What are the other possibilities coming off of that? And how many of you heard of with the Iroquois Confederacy, that they think the decision under the seventh generation. You heard that? Okay. So I was speaking to a group of architects in Kansas, and afterwards a young man came up, said, can I join you for lunch? Yes. So we had this great conversations, and he was explaining, he was a member of one of the tribes there, part of the Iroquois Confederacy, and he was talking with his elders about that. And one of his elders just shook his head and said, you don't get it. You think it's all about you and all the things that you're going to help lead into the future, seven generations forward. I said, no, you're in the middle. Think three generations ahead and three generations back. Boom. We are not going to survive unless we are more curious. Curiosity is the essential task in this day and age, Steve Jobs said, creativity is nothing more than connecting the dots. And a lot of people aren't very creative because they don't have enough dots to connect. The child's brain is basically kind of, you've, you've met children, little kids, and their brains seem to be filled with cobwebs, but they're also filled with questions. Um, Ian Leslie wrote a book called Curious, 
And he said that the, uh, between three and five, the average child asks 40,000 questions. Those of you who have, have, have had children, does that number sound too low? Well, in a book by Susan Engel called The Intellectual Lives of Children, and then on an Apple program called Becoming You, where they follow, like I think it's like 15 little kids, in their first 2,000 days, so from zero to five, and all the things they discover and learn. And in both of those, the book and the, the, the series, the children can hit gusts of 90 questions an hour. Because what they're trying to do is they have to recognize novelty. This is not like that. What is this? And what they're trying to do is decrease uncertainty. Ian Leslie, in his book, said, the children judge you on the quality of your answers. And they can very quickly tell whether or not you're an idiot because they will stop asking questions of you. And how many of you were like me and had a dad who would always give you wrong answers? Which was also helped with logic and understanding the nuances of language. So that, what the child does is called diversive curiosity. Just questions and just filling in the dots, but eventually they begin to form patterns. And the epistemic sense of curiosity is where you drill down, you rabbit hole, and you start to, the brain starts to identify that this is like that, and you build, you build competence, you build expertise. The problem is that quite often, when we get good at something, we stop being curious. And so we have to constantly push that. And part of the, the, the solution with that is to, is to understand or think about the term amateur. It comes from Latin, meaning to love. To love knowledge, to be curious, and to continue to seek it out as you go along. Um, and the question you have to ask is, what else do you need to be curious about? Because we do this, and we have to do this. In a book called Curious, with a question mark this time, by Todd Cashden, he said that couples who stay curious about, her, about each other stay together. And I think you could take the same concept and apply it to organizations, societies, nations, the world. We have to be more curious about each other. But you have to kind of curate it. Because we all know how obnoxious, really curious people can be as adults. So you kind of have to you know, pull it back a little bit. And quite often you do it on your own. However, I would, I would highly recommend if you want to learn, you don't do it on a device. Did you know that according to uh, Columbia University and the French National Institute, 59% of people who forward articles have never read the article. <laughs> they read the title or they read the first paragraph and go, well, I either hate this and I need to say it, or I love this and everybody needs to know that I agree. And studies also show that if you forward articles to people, you feel smarter. But think about the relationship between, or the differences between screens and books. The screens are always connected. Books are contained. There is also, this is very important, books are sensual. They're sensory. So you are physically holding them. You physically know where you are in the book. And um, Tim Parks, writing in the uh, New York Review of Books, he let me just grab some notes up here. And I knew it wasn't going to remember this whole thing. He 
He said, there is something predatory, cruel even, about a pen suspended over a text, like a hawk over a field is on the lookout for something vulnerable. The mere fact of holding the, the, the hand poised for action changes our attitude to the text. We are no longer passive consumers of a monologue, but active participants in a dialogue. A book is, you are not finished with a book until you engage with the author. So I, if I'm trying to learn something, it's a paper book, and I am writing away, arguing, underlying, highlighting, making connections, because that helps your brain consume the actual book. Um, Yahani Palazma, a Finnish architect, wrote a book called The Thinking Hand, says the use of the computer has broken the sensual and tactile connection between imagination and the object of design. It applies even to the design of sentences. When you were typing away, you can start a sentence, but then you can go back and change it. When you are writing out a sentence, you have to be thinking about what is the conclusion of the sentence. So you're using more brain cells to write. And they've even done studies where they will like divide up a classroom. So this half, type your notes. This half, they write their notes. So which side had more comprehensive notes? The typers had more comprehensive notes. Which ones had better short-term and long-term comprehension? The handwriters. The typists were stenographers. The writers were thinkers. And I think given the, the, the direction with AI and all these you know, chatbots, things like that, um, you're not going to be able to compete with those, those devices. They're going to write things for you. You're going to see news written by it. You're going to see all sorts of things written by an AI. But what if we try to be more eloquent, more elegant? We can't compete in the bigger, brighter, louder. Oh, and the, uh, the woman there, that would be my mom while well, she was at Marquette. So, are laws meant to be broken? No. You may be a judge, I don't know. Um, no, laws are meant to be tested. Is this a valid law? Is this a good law? The word pirate comes from the Greek, meaning to put to the test. Pirates weren't outlaws. They were, the, the, the outlaws, those were the corsairs. The pirates were always figure, on, on the edge of the law trying to figure out what works right now, what works right here, what, learn, what works short term, what works long term. And you can see there a perfect example of piracy. There is a gate. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a law. Doesn't seem to be a reason for it. So people drive around it. Are they breaking the law? Yes. Is that law valid? Maybe not. I don't know. And then, do you have a right to be wrong? And sometimes the desire to go outside the loop, to go offline, is a really powerful thing. And we have to be cautious with it. But we can't be too cautious without the freedom to fail, you really are not free. So you've heard about the experience economy. That was talked about for a long time. And they said, no, it's the attention economy, because that's really the resource in the economy that we're after. It's neither of those. It's the attitude economy. What do teenagers have more than anything else? Attitude, and it's the filter for the society and the economy that you threw at them and didn't protect them from. Doing um, this is sort of a, a, a preview of a talk that I'm doing for a it's called the Heritage Chocolate Society on February 7th out in Richmond, and it's it's a, a gathering of the heads of major um, historical museums. And they're trying to work out how do they connect with young people. 
And one of the things I've observed while working with economic development groups, things like that, is those little things like that are delights, that are not sort of by permission, but they take it anyway. So how many of you have ever seen a wall repaired with Lego blocks? There is a mosque in Morocco where they repaired the bricks with Legos. At Ali's Boys, uh, the bagel shop down on the south side, there is a little fairy door right at the base of the entry. And you see these things all over the place. And I was at a museum in the uh, art museum in Sacramento where they had instructions. This is now a few inches off the ground for the kids. Little sort of Easter eggs to just engage with people. And it is the difference between the measured and the immeasured. What I want to suggest that we do is we learn to break the fourth wall. And maybe sometimes with young people, let them in, let them understand what's behind the scenes. What, what are we struggling with? What are we doing? But help them to see that it is a bigger world out there. And give them a little bit of permission to have agency. We found, like I worked with a lot with the American Institute of Architects and in engaging young people, that the way to approach them was first side by side before face to face. You're showing up the same places, you're, you're talking about what's in front of you. You have to build trust. That, gener that younger generation, they build trust this way before they build it that way. But we also found that engagement does not mean surrender is you have to stand up for what you believe. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's good. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's outdated. And the older I get, the more I agree with that. So at your tables, you see little buttons? So you each got a button. And this was a project I started about four years ago, but really took off during the pandemic, where everybody was angry and everybody was paranoid. And so what I started doing is making these buttons in a little button machine that I uh, bought, and I would put quotations on them, or sometimes just little images or flowers, and I would just put them everywhere. So I've made over 4,000 of them in those years, and I put them on bulletin boards um, at Honey Pie, where I would, Honey Pie Restaurant down in Bayview, where I would go for breakfast. I would leave those around, and then after about two years, one of the wait staff said, David, are you the button man? Because they didn't know where they were coming from, but she found it. She said that, oh, we get so engaged with it. We're just always talking about the buttons and which ones we like, which ones we don't, and we're exchanging them. So what I want you to do is take the buttons. And if you like it, keep it. If you don't, give it to somebody or just leave it someplace. But how do we get people to think a little bit more. But young people, they, they, the, um, I ended up giving them over 500 buttons and then they could, people could take them. And while they're standing in line, they're having conversations. They're not talking about the weather. They're talking about philosophy. Like this one from G.K. Chesterton, the purpose of an open mind is to close it on something solid. Art asks questions, design answers questions. Be brave enough to be bad at something new. But think about how can you engage? How can you break the fourth wall and just start leaving things about what you believe in? There should be Rotary Club buttons with quotations from famous Rotarians. And you just anonymously leave them out there. Okay, we have to wrap this up. How do we... You don't want to go and get a degree in futures research. But you can still be a futurist with two simple things. You can start with this. Number one, start smoking. What do smokers do that other people don't? Yeah, there's all this like take breaks. You know, when you're saying that, you're like, kind of a little tension in your voice, isn't there? Because while they're taking a break, what are you doing? Working. Hey, come here. Work is overrated. Work is good. It's good for the soul. It's good for all sorts of things. 
But there are other good things too. Like having conversations. Smokers are the most reviled minority group out there. We hate smokers and we are proud that we hate them. We will tell people, oh, I hate smokers. When, any, when, it, when one smoker sees another, they know they have a friend and matches. But where else will you see like a senior executive talking to an entry level employee? It is sort of the great equalizer out on the loading dock. Now, my dad was a radiologist, my mom a nurse. My point is not to take up smoking, but there are worse and, and more unhealthy things you can do. Perhaps like sitting. Gotta take breaks. Leo Tolstoy said, all great literature is one of two stories. A man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. And strangers are gatekeepers for curiosity. They know things you don't. And you have to relearn how to be diversely curious to find out more. All right, so if, number, if, if the first one is to start smoking, what would be the second one? Start drinking? How unprofessional. Start drinking. No. Oh, wait, it is start drinking. You're good. You're really good. The Kentucky Fried Research Council, there actually is one. They did a study and they found out the average American spends less than 15 minutes having lunch. I'm going to assume that all of you are average Americans. Where do you have lunch? At your desk. With whom? With my precious. I've missed you so much, but I have never left you. When you break bread, you break barriers. And that's the essence of what it is that you are doing here and you always need to do. And finally, you need to get drunk. Oh, wait, there's more to that. Um, there is a book by Edward Stringerland called Drunk, How We Sip, Danced, and Stumbled Our Way into Civilization. It is a brilliant book. It's hilarious. He's an English writer. So you'll go along your thing, and it's very scholarly, and all of a sudden you'll say something, you just you burst out laughing. It is so interesting. But there was a big part of the book that talked about sort of the, the brain is divided between two Greek gods. You've got Apollo, and Apollo's like the prefrontal cortex. It's all about order, structure. I mean, it created civilization. I mean, you know, props for that. Um, it makes plans, um, gets the job done. But civilization is more than reason and order, and so is the future. Um, how do we bring some of that back? Well, Dionysus, he's the fun god. Likes to party, likes to talk, likes to play, lets his hair down, lets off steam. He makes friends, and with just enough drink, even forgives and befriends his enemies. The author is very clear about the dangers of alcohol, but he is also very clear about the role it has played in civilization and in negotiations and how we just sometimes need a little bit to help us relax. Apollo wants to measure everything, wants to be in control. Dionysus wants us to dance and enjoy the moments and be perhaps a bit more poetic. I am willing to give 80% of the world to Apollo. We can measure the heck out of things, but I want 20% where we can sing and dance and play and be poetic because maybe the future needs poetry. Thank you. Questions, comments, accusations? Um, there are cards up here. There are a few more buttons if you want to raid that pile, and the slides will be provided um, as a PDF. Yes? Presentation. In, I think it was your first point, 
you spoke to freedom and equality are enemies. Can you expand on that, please? Um, so when you have more freedom, you have less equality. When you have more equality, you have less freedom. But total freedom is a jungle, and total equality is, is tyranny. And so the, the idea is they dance. But if I would ask this audience, which, if you had to choose one, freedom or equality, which one would you choose? And most people say freedom, because if you've made it into my audience, life has been pretty good to you, and you know how to navigate. And then I always ask, who would say equality? And are you listening to those voices? They are a paradox. They are opposite sides, and we need both. But it's very difficult to measure them, so that wh that's why the metaphor is dance. I'm going to try to uh, connect a couple dots. You talked about curiosity and Drucker and so forth. Drucker always also said uh, a culture eats strategy for lunch uh, or some such. And you talked about curiosity and, and asking questions and dialogue, whether it be a marital situation or societal situation. Um, in today's cancel culture, whether it's a, a fad or a trend, kind of project forward what would happen to us as a society if we uh, stifle the dialogue between and among each other, realizing that there was a recent article on, was it 20% of, uh, at least 20% of university faculty self-censor as opposed to asking the tough questions or to have the dialogue. And uh, Most speak people to that. Most people self-censor today. That's what the, the research shows. Right. So speak to the, the end game, where, the, where this takes us, given the need for curiosity, dialogue, and finding new truths. Uh, you, have to, you have to have the freedom to be wrong. And, you know, there's that notion of come let us reason together. And there's an old Latin phrase of who watches the watchers. Well, we don't want this. We don't want that to be said. We don't want that to happen. Well, who gets to judge? And so that is the, 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 the sort of the reason for a democratic society. And I think it was Reinhold Niebuhr who said man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible. Man's tendency towards injustice makes democracy necessary. And so we want, we want things to be copacetic. We want everybody to get along, but, but you know, it's not the way the world works. And so we have to constantly keep trying to re-engage. But these things are rabbit holes, and they are, they are engines of confirmation bias, where you just keep finding more and more of what you agree with and so, like, you know, both my watch and my, I'm, you know, I'm pretty high tech, um, as you might expect from a futurist, but this has been turned off since 11. And the idea is that when you are engaging with other people, other than using this example, I never let the client, any of my audience, see me touching my phone. It's about engagement. And it's, it's having those conversations. So we need to have, I think we need to be better trained to know how to listen rather than always assuming what you know. You know, the, uh, there was, so with that history group, um, there was an article that the client sent around. It was on, um, we can end the history wars right now. And so there's this assumption that left and right hate each other because they're so wrong in what they believe. But the research shows that people are actually a lot closer, but what they're doing is listening to the pundits talk about what's, what the other people think about. And so there has to be more of that engagement. Yes? To that point, um, one of the things that I keep observing is the centering of self. And how do we ask and challenge people that we're having really difficult conversations with to rise above the centering of self or personalizing everything so that we can have a discussion about wildly creative and curious ideas? That's a really good, uh, really good question. And I'm reminded of like Martin Buber's um, I and thou is, is, you know, almost from a theological perspective of that you are honoring that other person as a thou. And it necessitates that the I is humble. 
And so teaching a little more humility. And, you know, life, you would think after a while, life would show we should be more humble. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. Oh, oh, one more. I've got a really deep one for you. Star Trek or Star Wars? Yes. Yes. <laughs>